In today's episode, I will be talking to Amber Christian what it's like to be a female founder in the tech industry and what lessons can be learned in the corporate market. Listen in to hear the rest of our conversation. Before we begin our conversation, here is a quick shout out to the Pathologically Curious. Check out the Maverick Paradox magazine. It's a digital magazine written by Mavericks for business owners and professionals. You can find the magazine at themaverickparadox.com. The magazine's aim is to provoke Maverick leadership everywhere. Welcome to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where we explore what it is to be a Maverick and discover effective modes of leadership. I am Judith Germain, and my mission is to propel the maverick mindset into a world where character and integrity will ultimately have a higher premium than personality and bureaucracy. So thank you for joining me on this journey. If you would like to continue with me, then please subscribe to my podcast on iTunes, Stitcher or one of the other popular podcast platforms. And today our guest is Amber Christian. Hi, Amber. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me on the podcast. No worries. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Tell listeners something about yourself. Absolutely. So I'm Amber Christian. I'm based in Minneapolis, Minnesota in the States, if you hadn't already picked it up from the X. So uh, so I'm the founder of a technology company called Wonderly Software Solutions. And I've actually spent the last 20 years in tech, which I'm sure is going to elicit some interesting conversations today. (laughs) <laughs> yes, it's, it is unusual to have uh, a female founder that is still going. How long has your company been going for? This particular company has been going for two and a half years, and we mm. spent the last two years bringing a product to market. Prior to that, I had a services company for six years as well. So quite a few years that I've had my own businesses. So therefore, you know all that you can be known about running a business. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I would say I know some and I learn a lot day after day, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um it's all a change, isn't it? Yeah. So so what's it like being a female in the tech industry? As a female in the tech industry, I've had to really find my space. You know, where where is my place, where is my role, and and figure out how to claim that and what does that look like. Because you have the dynamics at the one point of of leadership, but we also see, and you've seen in the news and articles, things that have come out, you also can't act like a man, you get punished for that, right? So Mm. there's there's a whole dynamic around leading as a female. And it took me a number of years in technology to figure out that my style is highly collaborative. It's a leadership style of conversation and thought and then making decisions. So it takes a little while, but absolutely results in sound decisions that aren't flipping back and forth all the time, which is the good part of it. So I would say I've really grown into much more of that collaborative, quiet, sort of servant leader that you'll hear people talk about. Um, That's my style. That sounds brilliant. Thanks for that, Amber. One of the things that you see on TV in in the um, fictional side of things is that female founders, especially in the tech industry, are one, ignored, or two, have to flirt um, and be ultra-feminine in a way that, if you're not in that industry, she seems scandalous. Is, is that true, or is that just Hollywood? In my experience, that's more Hollywood than reality. <laughs> you! <laughs> I'm- now, then, then again, I haven't, you know, I haven't gone through a big VC fundraise or anything, uh-huh. you know, with venture capital, so I can't really speak to that side of it. But yeah, I would not want to have to do that. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> and it's one thing to have fun and to laugh, and I yeah. like to joke about things and be playful about things. But yeah, that not as much, and I haven't really experienced having to do that, you know, to get attention, and it. Really, it's a lot of it. What it's about is, are you finding the right allies and advocates that yes. support and open doors for you, than it is about trying to be someone you're not. And so, what I've really focused on is, how do you recognize allies 
and, and learn and get to know them because they'll open the doors for you versus trying to open all them yourself. You won't get as far by trying to adopt a style or be something you're not. You're much better off finding and building um, ongoing relationships, conversations with allies because they help open doors. And so that, that's how I've tackled that. That makes a lot of sense. I think that you might have some wisdom to share with listeners around sort of female leadership because mm -hmm. I, cause I, I know that a lot of senior women can often struggle to step up into that senior role um, yep. when they're the only, say, the only female on the board or something like that. Mm -hmm. yep. so what, what advice would you give? Mm -hmm. I think it's all about finding what is unique about you and what you bring to the table that everyone else doesn't. So if I were stepping into a board position, I'd take a look at what are all the roles and backgrounds of other people? What skills do I bring that are different? And when you really, you almost, you analyze, you get analytical about it. Mm. That actually helps a lot to go, oh, okay, well, this person's background is marketing. This person's background is accounting. Well, for me, it's like, oh, okay, I bring a lot of technology knowledge and about how to build businesses from really small businesses because that's what I've done. Mm. And so what I would suggest for most women is be a little analytical about it before you judge yourself or before you say to yourself, oh, well, I wouldn't belong or I, I wouldn't necessarily bring something. Look at really look at it and say, okay, what do these people do? And the other thing you can do as well is talk to the existing people on some of these boards and say, do you see gaps in our skills or do you see gaps in what we could need to be a more well-rounded board? And you can also look at what skills you may bring to the table to make it more well-rounded. And yeah, because often people can say, Oh, okay. Well, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to bring, but just ask. You'd be surprised what people will tell you. <laughs> yeah, Amber, that actually reminded me of something that I did uh, years ago when I was still in corporate life, where there was this organisation that had a very tight board, um, and the the women that were there was two women on the board already, which were and they were feared but not liked, um, and I was coming on on board. And what I decided to do, uh, having you know seen the lay of the land and how things are working, I approached my equal on the opposite side of the business and asked to be and asked if he would be my mentor. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and he was really surprised. He was like, "Sorry, what?" And I was like, "Well, I just really think it'd be great because you know all this." And da, da, da. Um, he loved it. He then kind of came an ally. And it made it much easier to, to slide into that team and also to make effective change really, really quickly. Um, because you had to say you had that backup and that was very useful. Absolutely. And that's one of the biggest things to, you know, in new organizations or even as you rise in leadership, do not try to go it alone. You, you have to figure out where your allies are and the other people in the organization that think like you do. I mean, it's, it's not that it's a battle, but it's also just about understanding who's philosophically aligned and how you can work together to accomplish more. It's really about how do you be a team, even within the overall organization, when you might not have formal team structures. And these kind of folks open doors and they facilitate things for you that you, that's how you find all this hidden stuff. It comes yeah. from other people. Also, you know, as I suspect you know, it's not one-sided because you also bring another dimension to the other person and you become great friends um, and that friendship grows into something that's beneficial for both of you. So, you know, I think sometimes people can hear that and it sounds like, oh, the women are just trying to get this from the men and it's not because you don't mm -hmm. come empty-handed <laughs> or you wouldn't be oh. in those roles in the first place. It, exactly, exactly. And I tend to find in a lot of teams that I work with, with men, they'll tell me, you're forcing me to advance my processes like much further than I ever did because of the way your brain works and the way you organize and the way you do things. And they really yeah. recognize that that's actually a gift. And it's all about people that'll work with you versus, you know, it's collaboration, not confrontation. And the other thing I would suggest to people too is even as you take that next step forward, one of the other things to do is look behind you at who's coming behind you. Mm. 
Yeah. And who can you open a door for? And it, and it's not about putting extra responsibility on you. You never know when you opening a door for someone today results in something great for you further down the line. It's sort of like just planting seeds of helping other people as well as asking to be helped. And so when you have both of those dynamics that are going, it opens so many more doors because it might turn out that person that you made an opportunity available for has something presented to them later and says, oh, it's not for me, but you need to call this person. And all of a sudden new things show up. So it goes both directions. It's both with your peers and up as well as back. That makes perfect sense. Um, when we were talking earlier um, about you coming on the show, you were saying that you're a maverick and I wondered whether being a maverick has enabled you to succeed in your sort of male dominated arena. Yes, it has. It didn't work so well in corporate America. <laughs> <laughs> Common story. <laughs> Yes, I, I learned that in corporate America, I didn't see traditional boundaries. And so I would get in trouble. Like yeah. I didn't realize I wasn't go, supposed to go fix something. It'd be like, you're not supposed to fix that. Well, but there was a problem. And, was a problem. <laughs> and I wasn't trying to, to offend. We were just getting it solved. And people would say, nope, that's my turf. And it, yeah, what? we have, what? And for me, that was actually really hard to understand because I'm really analytical and I love puzzles and I like solving the problem and the business outcome. Mm -hmm. But that didn't always work in corporate America. Some teams that was great. Some teams like, not so much. Yeah. And I learned over time though, that when you're a consultant, they want you to break all those rules. They yes, want you to tell you all of it. And so I was like, oh, oh, okay. So I guess I have to sit on that side of the house in order to really embrace and, and fully embrace those Maverick skills. It was actually all the work I did in corporate that led to how I built my startup. And that is what is, I think, a little unusual and really Maverick about my story. So I used human-centered design to build my product. And so my product's actually called Bella Cena, which is mm -hmm. Italian for beautiful scene. And what it is, is it's a unified calendar to-do list and meeting management application. So I'm going after the massive problem of bad meetings mm -hmm. and trying to improve them. And what was maverick about the approach is even when I sat down with some of the original branding companies, before we'd written any code, I knew that I wasn't going to walk the journey of being an entrepreneur and building a software product unless I was doing that with customers, with people that may want to use my product someday. And that it took me a year to actually know that was called human centered design and is a very non-traditional way of building software. So most people today build software. They're like, I have this great idea. And I go write all of the code and I go, Hey Judith, can you use this? Here's how you use this. Will you use this? And you're like, well, I didn't ask you to solve that. Whoa, that doesn't work. Like I think I don't even have that problem. Right. And so you end up in people trying to sell you stuff that you that maybe doesn't even work the way you think. Yeah. So what we did instead using human centered design is said, Hey, what problems are you having related to your meetings and time? And we really understood what the problems were before we proposed a solution. Then we came up with a solution and then we replayed it back to them to say, is this, is this solving the problems? And is this something you would buy by the way? Right. <laughs> <I don't want laughs> That's kind of important. <laughs> kind of important. Yes. And then we kept iterating with people because they would come back and say, yeah, I like those concepts, but boy, I don't like it like that. Oh, that's not going to work because this situation happens. So we were in this continual learning mode. And what we did is we wired our company to be in constant learning mode and constant customer conversation, which is very unique and different for a technology company. Usually it's about building it and then selling it and then changing it to work the way they want, not ask them what they want, build that, sell that, and find the markets. So very different process that we used. And that really did make me a maverick um, from the build process perspective. That makes an awful lot of sense because I was thinking, when you was going through your process, I was thinking that's what a maverick does like when they're consulting. So it's not, mm -hmm. I've designed a product that I want to sell to you. It's like, just talk to me, tell me what's bothering you. And then you come up with something that fixed that specific issue because I know, I know that some of the people that I've worked with when they say so you 
build something new each time. I'm like, yeah. Why do you do that? He's like, because it solves the problem that that person has. And they're like, can't you just do one standard product? It's like, you don't have one standard client. So no, not really. <laughs> but you know, it seems like it's a surprise when you go from that um, person back to solution as opposed to solution looking for the right person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I learned so much along the way that is showing up now that I'm in the market and the comments that people make to me about the product. So we just launched in August and it's, it's out and available on the market, but I've had people make, give me this really interesting feedback. I had one person tell me, I said, you know, the way you've laid this out, whichever version of me shows up that day, this works. Wow. <laughs> I said, That's powerful. powerful. Yeah, I was like, whatever, what does that mean? <laughs> and because it was this, the, the way we did the layout and this to-do list and calendar, she goes, yeah, some days I'm really organized and I'm really planful and I lay out all the time and I do all the time blocking with the to-dos and it's great. And then other days I'm hanging on by my fingernails. I'm just trying to survive and I'm a hot mess. And it works great those days too because it doesn't make me do it that way. And I, I thought, oh, I, I hadn't, that hadn't occurred to me to have it just designed one way because we'd had so many conversations and I've talked with so many people. So it's really interesting, the deeper you get into these conversations, what becomes sort of your natural way of thinking and designing, it grows and changes with that process and with that customer interaction. So that's been, been very unique in our process. And it makes it a lot more fun as well, doesn't it? Oh, it's incredibly fun because we have conversations now. I am so excited about speaking of Maverick, where I'm going to go with this. I'm yeah. really excited because I'm getting to ask an entirely different set of questions because we've spent two years building with empathy. Like now what's interesting is when I, people know that I'm sort of this empathy person and the way I approach it. And we talk about the problems that it's not about, here's my solution and try to sell it to you, but let's talk about the challenges and see if that's you. All right. So this, this is a very different conversation. And what's really fun is how honest people get with you. Oh, that is actually awesome. It can be brutal sometimes, but it's truly awesome. So people will say things like, let's take your cell phone. So let me ask you, what do you think when someone asks you to download a new app on your phone? What is your first thought? Personally, I'm like, what? <laughs> 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 Why? <laughs> That's the nice way of saying it. So do you know what they'll say to me? <laughs> <laughs> I have had people say, and I quote, if you ask me to download one more app, I'm going to throw my phone out the window. <laughs> He's like, yeah, it's full already. Let's tell me how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> or they say, I'm out of memory on my phone. I, I'd have to figure out something to delete to do it. Uh, I'm just going to bother. So in thinking about an app, you know, there's this conventional wisdom. That everything has to be an app. Mm. Why well, a web platform first? And we're, it's not a whole separate app and all that. It's on your computer because that's where people are traditionally doing most of their planning for a lot in our market. And what mm. I learned out of that was to ask a different series of questions. And so I said, as opposed to saying, hey, I want to hand you one more app that you don't want and you don't want to use, the question I get to ask as a maverick is, how do you use your mobile phone today? How, how might you interact with that? So we're going to build in the ability to add a to-do to your to-do list by texting it. So you can just use voice to text. You're doing that already. Most people tell me, oh, I text myself a reminder when I want to remember something. Oh, I email myself. So we are really taking the opportunity to go, hmm, how do you use your existing technology? How can we fit so that we're easy for you to use so that we just fit with life? right? Because you're already doing all these other things anyway. And that's where it takes you when you really get those conversations and you get that empathy going and people feel like they can tell you anything. They can tell you, I don't really want an app or I only really need super limited stuff. I would rather do these other things instead with how they want to interact, like text message things or email things. 
that's when it starts to get incredibly fun as technology innovators, because we get to look at a whole different world when we look at how do you interact with it in your life. Wow, that sounds quite powerful. It, it is. It's so fun. I can't even tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I was It's like, if it isn't, if you don't have like that joy in what you're doing, I don't know why you're doing it. It's like sometimes when I have to, um, I try to avoid commun- commuting into London in the rush mm-hmm. hour. Um, sure. Obviously, when you work for yourself, you can do that most of the time. But the times when you have to and you, you're like, oh, I haven't done this for the last four months or something. So you, you're just like <laughs> doing your thing and it's fine. And then you're looking around and everybody else is like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know. I Nobody's car dancing to the music, right? No, everyone looks everyone so like, miserable. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, if you're going to do this every day, what does that do to you? You know? Well, I know what it does to you. That's why I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, and like for me, I try to um, help organizations so that their staff, their employees aren't doing that in the morning. They're actually eager to come to work as opposed to like, another day. Yeah, right. which is mm-hmm. quite which is quite funny. Um, when I was looking at your website to to look 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 you up and find out more about you, one of the things that you said was that you make sure that people who don't have a voice have a voice. Um, why do you think women should have a voice in technology? What is it that women bring uniquely mm-hmm. to it? One of the things I found in having conversations with a lot of women, I struggled with, even as an engineer, a lot of times when I would use software, I would think, oh, I don't think like this. And I would, what what a lot of women tend to do is then we tend to blame ourselves for that. Like, oh, well, I don't think right. Or I don't know the proper way. We, we can, as women, we can be really mean to ourselves. Let's be honest, right? And that the whole being very hard on ourselves seems to come naturally for a lot of women. <laughs> I can't relate, <laughs> but I understand it to be true. <laughs> <laughs> what a polite way of putting it. <laughs> but no, it's just, I'm a maverick, so I don't, I don't do that. But I do understand uh, speaking to other people that yes, a lot of women do feel that way. A- absolutely. And it's really, it's a really common thing. Yeah. And as I had more and more conversations, I realized I wasn't the only one that did that. You know, so on the one hand, I do all these innovative things, but on the other hand, I still had to live within existing technology sets and things. Yeah. That I said. And as I talked to more and more women, I, had, I discovered I wasn't the only one that felt that way. And I really started to realize, I started asking women, how often do you get asked to give your opinion about software? And I would get a blank stare and nine and a half times out of 10, never mm. was the response that I would get. And I discovered there was this big disconnect between the products we were using because again, of that original problem of we design them then tell you how to use them. And so often because the STEM fields are primarily male dominated, there aren't as many women represented even internally on the teams and things as well. Mm -hmm. So only so much can get caught. And so just the very nature of the way the processes were led to this outcome and how it was built and then led to how a lot of people feel about how they use the technology. And so I reversed it to say, well, if women were included in the process, they have a chance to tell me where their time struggles are and both women and men, I can represent both perspectives. The thing I discovered about men is there are also, there are some that are very visual and there's some that are not, that are very, like the structure even in men's brains is very different as well. And so what we really looked at is talked with a lot of people that like things visual. They tend to really like my product because you can see it all in one place and it's super visual. And so even for for men that respond to that, for women that really like that and that integrated nature. So I found it was really important because it brought more balanced perspective. It also brought simplification. The way that women approached some of the problems was really interesting in looking for simpler solutions that push the design envelope versus more complicated and engineered solutions. That was really interesting to me as well. So Bella's unique in that you know, when we did our human-centered design process, we had feedback from over 150 people between interviews, focus groups, 
testing our, our UX designs, our closed testing groups. And over half of that feedback, over half of that community was women. So that makes the entire product feel a little different. And, and I've had people tell me that too, of, yeah, it just, it just feels a little different. And people will say, huh, it's pleasant. It's funny, how, how do you describe your software as hmm, pleasant? <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, we still have to manage our to-dos in our calendars. And so there's things that are inherently unpleasant about that. But people will say, it's just a nicer experience. And it works the way I think. And I've, I've had customers say, thank you for building software that doesn't make me feel stupid. I Wow. And that is really powerful. You know, sitting on the other side of what was a long two-year journey of a process I was making up because I was navigating it on my gut because people don't do it this way. And so being in the market and then hearing, having someone say, thank you for not making me feel stupid means a tremendous amount to me as a founder. And you said that you were um, running a services business six years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so did you have a good male, female mix on, on that team? On uh, that team, I was the primary delivery person. So I didn't have a very big staff. I would just bring people in on projects if I needed them. Right. So that typically really depended on the project and who was hiring me. There was often a lot of times it was women in leadership positions that were hiring me for that work okay. because I came from a technology background and it was something similar where people would say, I can ask you anything and I understand your response. And it was in business language, not all in technology language. So I actually tended to find a lot of times I was hired by women because somehow the way I explained and the way we related really worked and really clicked. And yet I was still delivering the technology side of those implementations. And that was all in the SAP industry, which for any of your listeners that, that have used the SAP products, they're a whole world unto themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like, why? <laughs> And in fact, most of my career was spent in the SAP industry. And to be really fair, that is the industry that has paid to allow me to build Bella. That's how I could afford to build it. It's very well known, yeah. Yeah, I kept my services company because that allowed me to generate the revenue to build Bella out properly, right? Yeah. And this human-centered design process blocked the journey I needed to walk in order to build it, where if I didn't have that company, I may have had to make different choices. Hard to say, that's it, that's in hindsight. But for me, that was a nice balance and offset to let me think about building the company the way I wanted to build it to get it as published. Okay, so what advice have you got for those that are, are in a corporate organization who want to go out and run their own businesses? What's the, in a steady job, what's the best advice that you could give them? Yep. First thing I would tell you, start raising your profile now. Mm -hmm. So speaking engagements, writing, blogs, guest posts, work on improving your visibility, even in your current role first, because you will need a network way larger than you realize when yeah. you get out there. And that is, I even realized that when I started my services company six years ago, it's like I needed a network three times the size that I, that I had, but I didn't know that until I got out in it realizing just due to the, how varied project cycles were and budgets and all of these different things, I realized, wow, you don't have enough connections, Amber. Most of us don't have enough connections. And so what I would tell people is if you're thinking about starting that business, and you're thinking, oh, in a few years, I want to do it. Oh, yeah. Now is when you start speaking at conferences. Now is when you start, you know, having articles or things written about you or contributing content, learning all those skills you're going to need as a business owner and you do it on your current employer's time. I, th that's what I tell you. It's a win for them, too, because you're building new skills. But that's actually your starting point long before you put the business plan and you start that business is the visibility and the connections that you will need later, like years from now. That's really good advice. And I think it's people think, oh, I have a really big network. But what they don't realize is that the people, a lot of the people in your network are only in your network because of your current position and who you're working with. 
you know, exactly. when you and when you leave them, they're like, who are you? <laughs> yes. yes, exactly. And and all of a sudden you're not someone they're going to hire because you just came from that company. And not very often do they turn around and immediately then, you know, hire you as a consultant. They're like, no, you, we were paying for you as an employee, right? So you yeah. need a whole different set of people. And I would also tell you, reconnect with colleagues that have gone to other companies. Yes. Keep them close, right? Because they could be a source of business. They already know you, right? <laughs> so, Which is supposed to be a good thing. It should theoretically, it should be a good thing. Hopefully, it's a good thing. <laughs> At least the ones that you got along with, you know, start there. I, but definitely, I would say that that network and creating that network effect and figuring out, you know, how you will do that. And I even, you know, for me, I had to make this huge transition in, I was well known in the SAP industry and in that niche. I did payment technologies. So people knew who I was for that. I went over to the web world and startup land and building, building Bella and we're in, now we're in the land of Google. People go, who are you? <laughs> that didn't. It didn't translate. I mean, I already had some established, but I've had to spend a lot of time getting all those connections established and those relationships. And relationships take time to build. You can't expect to meet someone and then get something from them. No. You're, you're going to have to take time to build these. And so start doing that now when you have that time. It don't maybe add a, a guest blog or a speaking engagement every quarter Find a couple people to meet on LinkedIn, comment on some things, start meeting some people. And that's where you begin long before you need them. Yeah, one of the things I think about, you know, when you're in that corporate world, especially if you're senior, you're so busy that you can't breathe. And then when you start your own business, you realize that you weren't busy before. <laughs> you thought you were busy, but that's not busy. <laughs> that was an illusion of busy. And yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And I was the same way. And then once I started the business, I realized, wow, that that wasn't busy. You, you, but you also are forced to get to a whole new level of efficiency. That's the yes. beautiful part of it is you discover, wow, that thing you said that would have taken me probably six hours when I was an employee. I got it done four because I got two hours of other stuff that has to be done. <laughs> And you naturally can force yourself into those mechanisms. So yes, there there is the illusion of busy, but if you if you really want that, you have to find the time and you have to start freeing up. And it doesn't have to be a lot. It can be 15, 20 minutes to kind of research and do these things. You don't have to if you if you make it a huge thing, it will become oppressive. So start small, one little thing at a time. And I noticed that the 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 payback or for that is that if you do end up consulting and you go to an organization that you can see already how long that can be made efficient because you can see yeah. what people are doing that is not really that effective um it just because people tend to fit into the tram lines of things don't they absolutely absolutely and the and the other reason you know as i talk about raising your profile and um, actually, you know, having people be able to be a little more visible. So let's say whether that's PR and you get quotes and articles or you have guest blog posts or other things, you never know when that prospective customer is researching you mm. right? or is researching your expert status. And so I'll share a true story from when I was doing the service implementations. I used to <clears throat> write blog posts about a variety of technical topics in the payments industry super nerdy right I mean, yeah. it's not like this is going to have huge high readership but nobody was writing about some how to solve some of these problems so i started writing about it and i was surprised by how many people were finding it just in my niche in the industry and i was at my client one day and we were talking about some solutions and one of the the developers that i was working with came back and said yeah i was doing a bunch of googling and searching around for xyz problem that you were talking about and i found an article online about it no, oh, great. He said, yeah, you know who the author was? Who? You. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> and he said, and I realized nobody's talking about this. We're one of the few people talking about it. Oh, yeah, you really are an expert. I, you know, so it's interesting. You never know how that stuff will, will work out for you later. I mean, I certainly didn't write it with the intention that two years later some client would find it. I wrote it to be helpful. I wrote it to represent a point of view at that particular time, but
but it helps establish you in other ways. Or people would find me because I wrote an article and they're like, I really liked your style and the thought process you used. Can we talk? Oh, sure. Absolutely. There's people are researching, right? You think mm. about it, especially with your own company. I, th I think here in the States, it's something like 65 to 70% of consumers are out doing a whole lot of homework researching online before they ever make a purchasing decision. So you will need them to be able to find you, whether it's things you've written, website, et cetera. And so that's a reason to just sort of gently start out doing some of these things. Brilliant. That's really good advice. I, I think it's probably a good place to, to stop if you don't mind. No worries. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> well, thanks for having the conversation. It was really interesting. Lots of giggles and laughter. I hope people can understand what we were saying <laughs> between all the laughing. <laughs> will, will you come back again? Of course I will come back again. This was wonderful. I love talking about being a maverick. It's a lot of fun for me too. <laughs> Excellent. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you have enjoyed this. If you to are conversation with Amber as curious, much as I enjoyed having I would love it. to find out more about the Maverick Paradox, then please subscribe to this podcast on one of the popular podcast platforms. Alternatively, you could explore our resources on Mavericks at maverickparadox.com or read the Maverick Paradox magazine. We publish frequently each week. If you subscribe, you will get our monthly newsletter. And let's not forget my book, The Maverick Paradox, The Secret Power Behind Successful Leaders. For those that love a good discussion, you could apply to join our exclusive Facebook group. And finally, if you'd like to work with us or just interested in finding out more about the Maverick at work, check out our website, maverickparadox.co.uk.